Hi guys, I'm Dr. Anna Dale, and this is the first video in a new series about Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. This is an excerpt from his last major work of, uh, 18, of uh, 1850, 1851, uh, and this translation is uh, from 1890, a public domain English translation. This was published by Prometheus Books in about 1995. I'm just going to read the text and offer my commentary, and we'll see how it goes. Let me know what you think. We'll start with the introduction, which is less than a page. Here we go. Uh, if my object in these pages were to present a complete scheme of counsels and maxims for the guidance of life, I should have to repeat the numerous rules, some of them excellent, which have been drawn up by thinkers of all ages, from Theognis and Solomon down to La Rochefoucauld, and in so doing I should inevitably entail upon the reader a vast amount of well-worn commonplace. But the fact is that in this work I make still less claim to exhaust my subject than in any other of my writings. An author who makes no claims to completeness must also, in great measure, abandon any attempt at a systematic arrangement. For his double loss in this respect, the reader may console himself by reflecting that a complete and systematic treatment of such a subject as the guidance of life could hardly fail to be a very wearisome business. I have simply put down those of my thoughts which appear to be worth communicating, thoughts which, as far as I know, have not been uttered, or at any rate not just in the same form, by anyone else, so that my remarks may be taken as a supplement to what has already been achieved in the immense field. So, comment first, this is obviously a work of practical ethics, not going to be a systematic work or even an extension of Schopenhauer's systematic work in the world as will and representation and other systematic works. It's going to be simply a collection of counsels and maxims, as the title promises. Uh, so we'll look at the practical elements of life. Something This will be something more comparable to the uh, handbook of Epictetus or some work of practical advice. Back to Schopenhauer. Uh, however, by way of introducing some sort of order into the great variety of matters upon which advice will be given in the following pages, I shall distribute what I have to say under the following heads. 1. General rules. 2. Our relation to ourselves. 3. Our relation to others. And finally, 4. Rules which concern our manner of life and our worldly circumstances. I shall conclude with some remarks upon the changes which the various periods of life produce in us. So, There's the end of the introduction. Let's go then to section 1. Chapter 1. General Rules. 1. The first and foremost rule for the wise conduct of life seems to me to be contained in a view to which Aristotle parenthetically refers in the Nicomachean Ethics. And here he quotes the Greek, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but the citation is to uh, Ethics Book 7, Chapter 11 or 12. Or, as it may be rendered, not pleasure, but freedom from pain is what the wise man will aim at. The truth of this remark turns upon the negative character of happiness, the fact that pleasure is only the negation of pain and that pain is the positive element in life. This actually will pause for a comment. This may be the central idea from Schopenhauer's practical philosophy, that life is pain, that to live is to suffer, and therefore success in life involves the minimization of suffering. It involves playing it safe not trying to achieve some positive good, some real substantial benefit in a state that we would call happiness. That, he's going to say, is a source of error and misery. So to act correctly is to realize that happiness has no positive character, only pain has positive character. To escape from pain, therefore, is to be happy. So to realize that, that happiness is something negative, the absence of pain, that's, that's really the core of what Schopenhauer has to say in this part of the book. So back to the text. Though I have given a detailed proof of this proposition in my chief work, and here his footnote is to The World as Will and Representation, Book 1, I may supply one more illustration of it here, drawn from a circumstance of daily occurrence. Suppose that, with the exception of some sore or painful spot, we are physically in a sound and healthy condition. 
The pain of this one spot will completely absorb our attention, causing us to lose the sense of general well-being and destroying all our comfort in life. In the same way, when all our affairs but one turn out as we wish, the single instance in which our aims are frustrated is a constant trouble to us, even though it be something quite trivial. We think a great deal about it, and very little about those other and more important matters in which we have been successful. In both these cases, what is met with resistance is the will. In the one case, as it is objectified in the organism, in the other, as it presents itself in the struggle of life. And in both, it is plain that the satisfaction of the will consists in nothing else than that it meets with no resistance. It is therefore a satisfaction which is not directly felt. At most, we can become conscious of it only when we reflect upon our condition. But that which checks or arrests the will is something positive. It proclaims its own presence. All pleasure consists merely in removing this check, in other words, in freeing us from its action, and hence pleasure is a state which can never last very long. Interesting connection here with the idea of the will. The will wants what the will experiences then are barriers to the realization of its desires, of its wants. And this is what we experience as pain and as suffering. So what is happiness? What is joy? It is the removal of the barrier to the will so that it can achieve its goal. This is the true basis of the above excellent rule quoted from Aristotle which bids us direct our aim not towards securing what is pleasurable and agreeable in life, but towards avoiding, as far as possible, its innumerable evils. If this were not the right course to take, that saying of Voltaire's, happiness is but a dream and sorrow is real, would be as false as it is, in fact, true. A man who desires to make up the book of his life and determine where the balance of happiness lies must put down in his accounts not the pleasures which he has enjoyed, but the evils which he has escaped. That is the true method of eudaimonology. For all eudaimonology must begin by recognizing that its very name is a euphemism, and that to live happily only means to live less unhappily, to live a tolerable life. There is no doubt that life is given us not to be enjoyed, but to be overcome, to be got over. And I'll pause again just to say that this is it's a classic Schopenhauerian line. The, the goal of life is to endure, to tolerate, to settle, not to achieve some exalted state of bliss, to, to achieve a positive happiness. There are numerous expressions illustrating this, such as digere vitam vita de fungi, or in Italian, si scampa così, or in German, man muss suchen dort zu kommen, er wird schon dort die Welt kommen, and so on. In old age, it is indeed a consolation to think that the work of life is over and done with. So pause here to say we might also think here of uh, Cephalus's comments to Socrates in Book I of Plato's Republic on that very point. The happiest lot is not to have experienced the keenest delights or the greatest pleasures, but to have brought life to a close without any very great pain, bodily or mental. To measure the happiness of a life by its delights or pleasures is to apply a false standard. For pleasures are and remain something negative. That they produce happiness is a delusion cherished by envy to its own punishment. Pain is felt to be something positive and hence its absence is the true standard of happiness. And if, over and above freedom from pain, there is also an absence of boredom, the essential conditions of earthly, ha earthly happiness are attained, for all else is chimerical. Okay. Long paragraph here on page 8 of this text, and Schopenhauer has told us, really connecting this with ideas, folk wisdom, and uh, as a slogan of Voltaire's, that Life is pain. Pleasure is and remains something negative. The difficulty that comes in life is the intellectual, philosophical error of supposing that there is a positive happiness or flourishing to be had. In fact, there are simply threats to fend off 
And if you arrive at the end of your life having successfully avoided calamity, having fended off all of the threats and all of the sources of pain and suffering in your life, then you have lived as happily as it is possible for a human being to live. I think most of the rest of this book is just going to be simply the, the deep realization, I'm sorry, the, the sort of practical realization and consequences of that deep truth, if Schopenhauer is if Schopenhauer's correct about it. I think his whole philosophy is built around that exact point. Pain is affirmative, pain is positive, has a positive existence, it's real. Happiness is the absence of pain, the way darkness is the absence of light. Okay, to think otherwise is, is to court disaster and unhappiness, is to court misery. It follows from this that a man should never try to purchase pleasure at the cost of pain, or even at the risk of incurring it. To do so is to pay what is positive and real for what is negative and illusory. While there is a net profit in sacrificing pleasure for the sake of avoiding pain. Okay, so what's the rule here? Don't risk pain and loss for the sake of happiness. Instead, sacrifice your happiness in the interest of avoiding pain. This is the sort of practical version of the error that we make, that we, that we would make. We need to keep, keep our priorities straight, Schopenhauer seems to say. In either case, it is a matter of indifference whether the pain follows the pleasure or precedes it. While it is a complete inversion of the natural order to try and turn this scene of misery into a garden of pleasure, to aim at joy and pleasure rather than at the greatest possible freedom from pain, and yet how many do it? There is some wisdom in taking a gloomy view, in looking upon the world as a kind of hell, and in confining one's efforts to securing a little room that shall not be exposed to the fire. What an image, right? Imagine that the world is hell. Your goal is to find a slightly less flamey part of hell in, in which to suffer the remainder of your life. Um, the, the difficult, again, the, the error is aiming at joy, aiming at happiness. That's just a mistake. The fool rushes after the pleasures of life and finds himself their dupe. The wise man avoids its evils. And even if, notwithstanding his precautions, he falls into misfortune, that is the fault of fate, not of his own folly. As far as he is successful in his endeavors, he cannot be said to have lived a life of illusion, for the evils which he shuns are very real. Even if he goes too far out of his way to avoid evils and makes an unnecessary sacrifice of pleasure, he is, in reality, not the worse off for that, for all pleasures are chimerical, and to mourn for having lost any of them is a frivolous and even ridiculous proceeding. So at the end of your life, the, ple the pains that you have avoided are, he's saying, a kind of real positive benefit to you. The pleasures that you might have missed out on, you haven't missed really anything here. Reading this now, I'm thinking here of uh, the way in which Nietzsche and Nietzsche's uh, philosophy of the uh, will to power seems a, a very hard pushback against this idea, this will to pessimism, this will to nothingness that he'll call it. So maybe a, a point of contrast here between Schopenhauer and, uh, and Nietzsche. Maybe also want to think of Nietzsche, uh, Schopenhauer's influence on Wagner uh, in this regard. The failure to recognize this truth, a failure promoted by optimistic ideas, is the source of much unhappiness. In moments free from pain, our restless wishes present, as it were, a mirror, an image of happiness that has no counterpart in reality, seducing us to follow it. In doing so, we bring pain upon ourselves, and that is something undeniably real. So something like a will-o'-the-wisp, right? a sort of magic mirror, a sort of fairy tale. But there's, there's happiness there. This is the sort of Dr. Seuss, you know, I had trouble in getting to Sala Salu. Um, vision. It is misleading. The wise man refrains from, from following these, these trails. Afterwards, we come to look with regret upon that lost state of painlessness. It is a paradise which we have gambled away. It is no longer with us, and we might in vain, we long in vain to undo what has been done. One might well fancy that these visions of wishes fulfilled were the work of some evil spirit, conjured up in order to entice us away from that painless state which forms our highest happiness. A careless youth may think that the world is meant to be enjoyed, as though it were the abode of some real or positive happiness. 
which only those fail to attain who are not clever enough to overcome the difficulties that lie in the way. Right? We think, you know, if I were clever enough, I could achieve happiness. That's really what I need to be super clever. This false notion takes a stronger hold on him when he comes to read poetry and romance and to be deceived by outward show, the hypocrisy that characterizes the world from beginning to end, on which I shall have something to say presently. The result is that his life is the more or less deliberate pursuit of positive happiness, and happiness he takes to be equivalent to a series of definite pleasures. In seeking these pleasures, he encounters danger, a fact which should not be forgotten. He hunts for game that does not exist, and so he ends by suffering some very real and positive misfortune, pain, distress, sickness, loss, care, poverty, shame, and all the thousand ills of life. Too late, he discovers the trick that has been played upon him. But if the rule I have mentioned is observed, and a plan of life is adopted which proceeds by avoiding pain, in other words, by taking measures of precaution against want, sickness, and distress in all its forms, the aim is a real one, and something may be achieved which will be great in proportion as the plan is not disturbed by striving after the chimera of positive happiness. This agrees with the opinion expressed by Goethe in the elective affinities, and there put in the mouth of Mittler, the man who is always trying to make other people happy. To desire to get rid of an evil is a definite object, but to desire a better fortune than one has is blind folly. The same truth is contained in that fine French proverb, le mieux est l'ennemi de bien, the, the, uh, the, good, the, the best is the enemy of the good. Leave well alone. And as I have remarked in my chief work, okay, footnote, World is Will and Representation, book two, chapter 16, this is the leading thought underlying the philosophical system of the cynics. For what was it led, that led the cynics to repudiate pleasure in every form, if it was not the fact that pain is, in a greater or less degree, always bound up with pleasure? To go out of the way of pain seemed to them so much easier than to secure pleasure. Deeply impressed as they were by the negative nature of pleasure and the positive nature of pain, they consist consistently devoted all their efforts to the avoidance of pain. The first step to that end was, in their opinion, a complete and deliberate repudiation of pleasure, as something which served only to entrap the victim in order that he might be delivered over to pain. Okay. The point here being, as the ancient cynics, the dog philosophers, saw, that one can't have pleasure without an accompanying pain, and so one is best off avoiding the pain by sacrificing the pleasure. And that seems to be just the type of advice that Schopenhauer offers us here. We are all born, as Schiller says, in Arcadia. In other words, we come into the world full of claims to happiness and pleasure, and we cherish the fond hope of making them good. But as a rule, fate soon teaches us in a rough and ready way that we really possess nothing at all, but that everything in the world is at its command in virtue of an unassailable right, not only to all that we have or acquire, to wife or child, but even to our very limbs, our arms, legs, eyes, and ears, nay, even to the nose in the middle of our face. And in any case, after some little time, we learn by experience that happiness and pleasure are a fata morgana, which, visible from afar, vanish as we approach. That, on the other hand, suffering and pain are a reality which makes its presence felt without any intermediary, and, for its effect, stands in no need of illusion or the play of false hope. So, what promises you pleasure and happiness and joy is deceptive. It is this uh, kind of will-o'-the-wisp or uh, fantasy uh, misleading you, luring you away. If the teaching of experience bears fruit in us, we soon give up the pursuit of pleasure and happiness, and think much more about making ourselves secure against the attacks of pain and suffering. We see that the best the world has to offer is an existence free from pain, a quiet, tolerable life, and we confine our claims to this as to something we can more surely hope to achieve. 
for the safest way of not being very miserable is not to expect to be very happy. This just incidentally, this, this sounds like um, the work of a somewhat embittered old man. Perhaps, uh, perhaps yes, perhaps no. Merck, the friend of Goethe's youth, was conscious of this truth when he wrote, it is wretched the way people have of setting up a claim to happiness. And that too is a measure corresponding with their desires that ruins everything in this world. A man will make progress if he can get rid of this claim and desire nothing but what he sees before him. Accordingly, it is advisable to put very moderate limits upon our expectations of pleasure, possessions, rank, honor, and so on, because it is just this striving and struggling to be happy, to dazzle the world, to lead a life full of pleasure, which entail great misfortune. It is prudent and wise, I say, to reduce one's claims, if only for the reason that it is extremely easy to be very unhappy, while to be very happy is not indeed difficult, but quite impossible. Let me pause over that for a moment, because it seems like it's something important and fairly clear that Schopenhauer has said. It is, should we reduce our claims, we, we aim for less, we lower our, our ambitions. Why? It is very extremely easy to be very unhappy in this life. But it is not, not, not only difficult, but impossible to be very happy. So rather than going for the extreme happiness, we should aim to avoid the very easy fate, the very common fate of being very unhappy. Okay, back to the text. With justice sings the poet of life's wisdom. And here he's quoting uh, in Latin uh, from Horace's Odes. I'm going to skip the Latin because my pronunciation is not great. Uh, the quote is to Horace's Odes uh, 2.10. The golden mean is best, to live free from the squalor of a mean abode and yet not be a mark for envy. It is the tall pine which is cruelly shaken by the wind, and the lofty towers that fall so heavily, the highest summits that are struck in the storm. He who has taken to heart the teaching of my philosophy, who knows, therefore, that our whole existence is something which had better not have been, and that to disown and disclaim is and to, that to disown and disclaim it is the highest wisdom. He will have no great expectations from anything or any condition in life. He will spend passion upon nothing in the world, nor lament over much if he fails in any of his undertakings. He will feel the deep truth of what Plato says, uh, quotation in Greek, footnote, Republic, book 10, number 604. Nothing in human affairs is worth any great anxiety. Or, as the Persian poet has it, Though from thy grasp all worldly things should flee, grieve not for them, for they are nothing worth. And, though a world in thy possession be, joy not, for worthless are the things of earth. Since to that better world tis given to thee to pass, speed on, for this is nothing worth. The footnote is to, uh, the translator's note uh, is um, uh, from Anvar E. Suhaili, The Lights of Canopus. Schopenhauer again. The chief obstacle to our arriving at these salutary views is the hypocrisy of the world to which I have already alluded, an hypocrisy which should be early revealed to the young. Yeah, part of the problem here, I think he's saying, is that the young people full of poetry and romance will pursue this positive happiness and decades later come to realize that it was all an illusion. They had best have taken the other line. So to become Schopenhauerian in this practical sense seems to mean to, as a young person, give up on that advanced pursuit. Most of the glories of the world are mere outward show. Like the scenes on a stage, there is nothing real about them. Ships festooned and hung with pennants, firing of cannon, illuminations, beating of drums and blowing of trumpets, shouting and applauding, these are all the outward sign, the pretense and suggestion, as it were, the hieroglyphic of joy. The hieroglyphic of joy, that's a great, that's a great expression. But just there, 
joy is, as a rule, not to be found. It is the only guest who has declined to be present at the festival. Where this guest may really be found, he comes generally without invitation. He is not formally announced, but slips in quietly by himself, sans fashion, often making his appearance under the most unimportant and trivial circumstances, or in the commonest company, anywhere in short, but where the society is brilliant and distinguished. Joy is like the gold in the Australian mines, found only now and then, as it were, by the caprice of chance, and according to no rule or law, oftenest in very little grains and very seldom in heaps. All that outward show which I have described is only an attempt to make people believe that it is really joy which has come to the festival, and to produce this impression upon the spectators is, in fact, the whole object of it. Okay. it it's all a sham. It's all a show. Don't fall for the show. Don't go to Australia seeking gold, which you'll find in tiny grains and not in great abundance. Okay. Realize this truth early in your life, he's suggesting. With mourning, it is just the same. That long funeral procession moving up so slowly, how melancholy it looks. What an endless row of carriages. But look into them. They are all empty. The coachmen of the whole town are the sole escort the dead man has to his grave. Eloquent picture of the friendship and esteem of the world. This is the falsehood, the hollowness, the hypocrisy of human affairs. Take another example. A room full of guests in full dress being received with great ceremony. You could almost believe that this is a noble and distinguished company. But, as a matter of fact, it is compulsion, pain, and boredom who are the real guests. For where many are invited, it is a rabble, even if they all wear stars. Really good society is everywhere of necessity very small. In brilliant festivals and noisy entertainments, there is always at bottom a sense of emptiness prevalent. A false tone is there. Such gatherings are in strange contrast with the misery and barrenness of our existence. The contrast brings the true condition into greater relief. Still, these gatherings are effective from the outside, and that is just their purpose. Chamfort makes an excellent remark that society, le cercle, le salon, ce qu'on appelle le monde, is like a miserable play, a bad opera, without any interest in itself, but supported for a time by mechanical aid, costumes, and scenery. Okay. This sound, Schopenhauer sounds here almost like um, was it Hamlet in, in his uh, famous soliloquy, right? Life's but an actor that struts upon the stage for a short time. Um, this, is, this is pessimism. And so too with academies and chairs of philosophy. You have a kind of signboard hung out to show the apparent abode of wisdom. But wisdom is another guest who declines the invitation. She is to be found elsewhere. The chiming of bells, ecclesiastical millinery, attitudes of devotion, insane antics. These are the pretense, the false show of piety. And so on. Everything in the world is like a hollow nut. There is little kernel anywhere, and when it does exist, it is still more rare to find it in the shell. You may look for it elsewhere and find it as a rule only by chance. That's the end of section one of uh, Councils and Maxims by Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, I've offered a brief commentary here. I hope you found it helpful. I'll look into the next sections in the next video. Hi, in this video, I'll take a look at sections two and three of Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. This is the final two pages of chapter one, uh, chapter one, which is titled General Rules. Here we go. Two. To estimate a man's condition in regard to happiness, it is necessary to ask not what things please him, but what things trouble him. And the more trivial things are in themselves, the happier the man will be. To be irritated by trifles, a man must be well off, for in misfortune, trifles are unfelt. This seems like a very good piece of advice. It's what we might today call uh, first world problems. If the main thing in your life to complain about is something that's relatively trivial in the big scheme of things, 
this indicates that everything else is going well. So we don't look for pleasure or prosperity as a measure of happiness. We look for what's the trigger level for things that annoy you, things that bother you. The more trivial the thing that bothers you is, the better off everything else must be then in order for that to be the one thing that get that uh, that really irritates you, that, uh, that bothers you. Uh, section three. Care should be taken not to build the happiness of life upon a broad foundation, not to require a great many things in order to be happy. For happiness on such a foundation is the most easily undermined. It offers many more opportunities for accidents, and accidents are always happening. The architecture of happiness follows a plan in this respect just the opposite of that adopted in every other case, where the broadest foundation offers the greatest security. Accordingly, to reduce your claims to the lowest possible degree, in comparison with your means, of whatever kind these may be, is the surest way of avoiding extreme misfortune. This again sounds like a very good sort of stoic themed advice. Uh, to minimize your chances of misery, of catastrophe, minimize the number of things which are absolutely necessary for you to flourish, for you to be happy. If you require eight things, the loss of any one of them will spoil your happiness. If you only require two things, or ideally even one, then you are in a much safer position. So uh, interesting, I like the interesting phrase, the architecture of happiness. Instead of securing yourself on a broad foundation, secure yourself on the narrowest foundation possible okay, with, re, uh, with regard to your means. Okay, so you want to make sure that if, if you have access to a large means, you live within those means and hopefully well within those means in terms of your pursuit of happiness. So you rely upon the, the least amount and you are in least danger of, of losing anything under some boundary conditions. Okay, next paragraph. To make extensive preparations for life, no matter what form these may take, is one of the greatest and commonest of follies. Such preparations presuppose in the first place a long life, the full and complete term of years appointed to man, and how few reach it. And even if it be reached, it is still too short for all the plans that have been made. For to carry them out requires more time than was thought necessary at the beginning. Okay, any of us who've ever planned something have discovered this, right? One, we're presuming upon a long length of years, and two, things always take much longer than you expect they will. And then how many mischances and obstacles stand in the way? How seldom the goal is ever reached in human affairs? And lastly, even though the goal be reached, the changes which time works in us have been left out of the reckoning. We forget that the capacity, whether for achievement or for enjoyment, does not last a whole lifetime. So when often, so we often toil for things which are no longer suited to us when we attain them. And again, the years we spend in preparing for some work unconsciously rob us of the power for carrying it out. How often it happens that a man is unable to enjoy the wealth which he acquired at so much trouble and risk, and the fruits of his labor are reserved for others, or that he is incapable of filling the position which he has won after so many years of toil and struggle. You might think of this as a kind of a bad joke, right? They spend all of your life building wealth, all of your life attaining to a certain high office, reaching it at the very end, and you find that time has changed you such, as you, you, you such that you're not able to enjoy it, you're not able to do with it what your ambition for it was. You, you've won, and in winning, you've lost. And this is the situation that Schopenhauer is pointing us towards as a hazard. Fortune has come too late for him, or contrarily, he has come too late for fortune. When, for instance, he wants to achieve great things, say in art or literature, the popular taste has changed. It may be. A new generation has grown up which takes no interest in his work. Others have gone a shorter way and got the start of him. These are the facts of life which Horace must have had in view when he lamented the uselessness of all advice. Quid eternis minorum consilis animum fatigas. I looked that up. That means roughly, uh, why do you torture yourself 
Why do you torture your poor reason for insight into the riddle of eternity? Okay. There's no point. Right? Uh, by the way, that same passage of Horace is quoted at slightly greater length by Nietzsche in section 109 of Human All to Human, which I have on the shelf here behind me. Um, that's worth looking into for a comparison. Nietzsche takes a slightly different attitude towards it than Schopenhauer does here. The cause of this commonest of all follies is that optical illusion of the mind from which everyone suffers, making life at its beginning seem of long duration, and at its end, when one looks back over the course of it, how short a time it seems. There is some advantage in this illusion, but for it no great work would ever be done. Okay. It's optical illusion. Okay. Life at the beginning seems to be quite long. When you're young, your whole life is ahead of you. You've got to rush to get into it, to get ahead into it. There's so much to do. Come closer and closer to the end of it, and it seems extremely short. This is the optical illusion that leads us to make great plans in our youth, which may not be paid off in our old age to the detriment of our overall happiness. Our life is like a journey on which, as we advance, the landscape takes a different view from that which, is pre which it presented at first, and changes again as we come nearer. This is just what happens, especially with our wishes. We often find something else, nay, something better, than what we were looking for, and what we look for we often find on a very different path from that on which we began a vain search. Instead of finding, as we expected, pleasure, happiness, joy, we get experience, insight, knowledge, a real and permanent blessing instead of a fleeting and illusory one. We don't find what we are looking for. We find something different, perhaps something better. Okay. This is, again, the wisdom of age, perhaps speaking to the, 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 uh, the folly and the enthusiasm of youth. This is the thought that runs through Wilhelm Meinster, like the bass in a piece of music. In this work of Goethe's, we have a novel of the intellectual kind, and therefore superior to all others, even to Sir Walter Scott's, which are, one and all, ethical. In other words, they treat of human nature only from the side of the will. So too in the Zauberflöte, that's the Mozart's magic flute opera of the 1790s, that grotesque but still significant and even ambiguous hieroglyphic. The same thought is symbolized, but in great coarse lines, much in the way in which source, much in the way in which scenery is painted. Here the symbol would be complete if Tamina were in the end to be cured of his desire to possess Tamina, and received in her stead initiation into the mysteries of the Temple of Wisdom. It is quite right for Papagino, his necessary contrast, to succeed in getting his Papagina. Again, and this is um, reference to characters in the magic flute. I, I don't recollect precisely, but uh, my, my uh, understanding is that uh, Tamino is the hero. He's the handsome prince. He's the great hero who has to undergo a test and become worthy of his opposite number. The, when when the, uh, the, the princess, the, the great uh, um, Tamina. And Papagino is his squire, his sidekick, his, uh, his sort of coarse, earthy uh, Sancho Panza type um, companion. At the end, Tamino wins Tamina and Papagino wins Papagina. And so there's a sort of, you know, Shakespearean double wedding kind of suggestion that, that the high uh, man wins the high woman and the low man, the sort of coarse man, wins his opposite number, the coarse woman. The suggestion here by Schopenhauer is that that's all well and good. That kind of marital sexual fulfillment, that sort of sort of happy ending, is good for Papagino, the sort of base, crude sort of person, ordinary man. But for the truly wise, um, noble prince, a better ending would have been for him for him to perhaps transcend his desire for Tamina, and to realize that he doesn't need her, and then to enter into the temple of wisdom, to to go to some sort of higher uh, place of uh, mental peace. Uh, and that, that, that's what I take to be his suggestion here, a kind of uh, remarkable attempt to uh, suggest a rewriting of the end of the Magic Flute. Uh, by the way, if you've not seen it, um, Ingmar Bergman, the director, did a very good movie version of the Magic Flute in 1975. It's worth trying to find if you haven't seen it yet. I can recommend it. Okay, back to, to Schopenhauer. 
Men of any worth or value soon come to see that they are in the hands of fate and gratefully submit to be molded by its teachings. They recognize that the fruit of life is experience and not happiness. They become accustomed and content to exchange hope for insight, and in the end, they can say with Petrarch that all they care for is to learn. Altro diletto cempar non provo, which means roughly, you know, learning is my sole delight. It may even be that they, to some extent, still follow their old wishes and aims, trifling with them, as it were, for the sake of appearances, all the while really and seriously looking for nothing but instruction, a process which lends them an air of genius, a trait of something contemplative and sublime. This is quite interesting here, the idea that, that perhaps uh, one achieves a certain kind of wisdom in seeking not to achieve one's ends, but to be instructed in the pursuit of one's ends, to, to acquire this experience of life, that this itself is the reward, that, that achieving the end doesn't matter. And even the suggestion here that uh, people who become wise in this way may continue pursuing the same aims and goals, but as trifles, as it doesn't really matter whether I actually finish writing this book or whether I actually achieve this goal that I set for myself, because it's, the, it's something about the process and the learning that comes from this, the dedication to the pursuit that is really important. In, in a different idiom, I think here of, of Kierkegaard's Night of Faith, as a man who, who is indistinguishable from others, but continues doing things, but with a sort of, uh, sort of um, an air of taking them not as seriously as they had been taken in the past. Of course, I, I know Kierkegaard's project is fundamentally different. The Night of Faith is not whom Schopenhauer is talking about here, but something that, that jumped into my mind. Okay, the very end. In their search for gold, the alchemists discovered other things, gunpowder, china, medicines, the laws of nature. There is a sense in which we are all alchemists. Okay. I think that's a great closing line for chapter one. Uh, there's a sense in which we are all alchemists. We're all pursuing something that is perhaps impossible. We all want to find the philosopher's stone. We all want to transmute lead into gold. And it's not that it's not worth possessing or that it's not worth pursuing it's that the pursuit will produce something quite different. It'll produce gunpowder. It'll produce some other good, which we could never have anticipated when we set out. And this is part of Schopenhauer's warning in the latter half of this section uh, against having elaborate plans for one's life. The, the best sort of plan, it seems, is not to have a plan, but to uh, move forward in the spirit of gaining experience rather than happiness. So that brings us to the end of chapter one of uh, Schopenhauer's Councils and Maxims. Chapter two is titled Our Relation to Ourselves. It's about 30 pages long, so we'll take that in several videos coming up. I hope you found this video uh, rewarding. Thanks very much for watching today. Goodbye.